Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? You look good. Oh, you can sing today. Wow, I've been. Si <laughs> I better not say that. <laughs> but anyways, you can sing. That's good. It says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, eh? And I guess that's what I do most of the times: make a joyful noise. But welcome to the River of Life Assembly. Welcome to God's House, 345 Beaverbrook Road, Miramichi East, just below the French School. For all those that are coming, looking for a place to worship, this is a great place. This is a great place to come. The Holy Spirit is here. And when the Holy Spirit is here, things will happen. People will be healed and saved and that's what we're here for. So we just welcome the Holy Spirit this morning into the midst of us. And so, Lord, we give you praise this morning and glory. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you, Father, that you love us. And for everybody out there that maybe someone never said they love them this morning, Jesus loves you and is here to meet your needs, to grant you whatever you need. And the simplest is all you got to do is accept him as Lord and Savior into your heart. So, Father, today I pray for Pastor John as he brings the word. I pray for the worship team. I pray for the people that have come here gathered in your name. I pray for all the people out there that are not feeling good. We come against that COVID in the name of Jesus, and we rebuke that virus and and plague in Jesus' name. We speak 91 
Psalm 91 over our city this morning. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
inside there because that mini skirt was blowing my hair. You guys have a cool sense of humor. I was I was reading a little thing on the internet before I came. These two old guys were talking, and they said uh, they were talking about. They're saying, "Yeah, John, this uh, might be John, but." Are we done with that one? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. I'll try this one. I was standing under the mini split. I saw this thing on the internet this morning, and it said, uh, talking about getting the, ch the church open back up again so that people could come, and these old guys were saying, uh, we can now have eight people in church without issues, and the other guy said, never seen that before. <laughs> So it's an interesting thing, isn't it, that we can have eight, we can have 50% of our building full without issues, but we probably will have issues. <laughs> John chapter 17, I want to continue my series on steps toward the cross. I want to speak about living with purpose, and uh, I'm, I'm running into a lot of uh, people over a period of time who are struggling with life in such a way they don't want to live anymore. And it's creating, it's causing me to do a lot of thinking about what is so going wrong with society, especially among the young people. And uh, I, I want to do some serious discussion about uh, what we need to get back to if we want to have a uh, healthy population, healthy people, healthy young people. And uh, John chapter 17 and verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Uh, we've been talking about the final days that Jesus had just prior to the cross and how he was fulfilling his purpose here on earth. And I, I was looking at John 17, and it may well be the most valuable piece of literature that we have because John 17 is a discussion between the Son and the Father. So when you read John 17, you get a little bit of an understanding of how God thinks and of how the purpose of God works on planet Earth. It, the John 17 is the prayer that Jesus prays just prior to the crucifixion. And so when you look at it, it's a fascinating, a fascinating something to read, piece of literature, because where else do you ever get a glimpse of the internal discussion of the Godhead? To me, that's totally amazing. And the last evening before the cross, you know, it's such a wonderful thing. I see somebody taking notes. It's such a wonderful thing to take notes when something important is being said. The last evening before the cross... It's recorded almost, as far as I can see, word for word, what Jesus said that whole evening. Now, all of the disciples were there, but John chose to take notes. And I think to myself, when something important is being said, it might be valuable to write it down because we have something extremely valuable written down, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 
and 17, the words of Jesus the night he was betrayed. And you think to yourself, what would be more valuable than that if it wasn't for the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7? And Jesus is discussing here in, in John 17 what this night is going to be all about. He's talking about, in, in John 13, 14, 15, he's talking about what they're going to go through and how to go through it and don't let your heart be troubled. And you think to yourself, there's more to that than a funeral sermon. There's something for every day in life in all those words. And I would highly, where we're facing each Easter, I would highly recommend that you read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 and not just read them, meditate on them, but let them and let them become part of your life. And chapter 17 begins with, after saying all these things. So John is noting where we are in the story. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven. And, and as we get to the end of this big dialogue of 13, 14, 15, 16, and now we're coming to a discussion of Jesus with the Father. And, and uh, he has had this big talk to the disciples and in chapter 16, the very end of that chapter, it said, then his disciples, verse 29 and 30, then his disciples said, we're starting to get it. We're starting to get this whole thing. They said, uh, at last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything and there's no need to question you. From this we believe that you came from God. This is a big moment, like, he has told them all these things, and they've really gotten something out of it. And then, and to that, Jesus responds in, in the last verses of, of chapter 16. Jesus asks, oh, do you finally believe? But the time is coming, in, indeed, it, it, it's now, when you will be scattered, each of you, to his own way, leaving me alone. He said, the evening isn't over yet, guys. This, we're, we're into something big here. And, and we're going to see some big things happen. It's after saying these things that Jesus looks up to heaven and allows his disciples to overhear a conversation between him and the Father. And you think, well, that's, that's amazing. And it's, what's amazing is we got it. We, we, we have it to read. And, and uh, I, I, I think that we'd be all wise to read it. One of the reasons I think it would be wise to read it is I have learned in, you know, uh, over 60 years of living that life has a bit of suffering in it. How many have learned that? Life has a bit of suffering in it, doesn't it? And, and uh, Jesus is about to suffer in John 17, and these are the words of his preparation of his own heart for suffering. And I think, Boy, you, you know, if we all have to do a bit of suffering, we might want to learn how to do it. You know, uh, I, I hate suffering personally. How many like suffering? <laughs> it, it begins with Jesus describing his purpose. John 17 begins with him describing his purpose. We're coming to uh, a climax of his purpose here on earth, the culmination of all that he was to do while he was here. We're coming to that major point in his life, and Jesus describes this night with a term. And the term he uses is the hour. And I think, I, I thought of that the other day as I read it. He said, my hour has come. And, and uh, we live by the moment, don't we? You know, we, we say live life by the, to the moment. And, and Jesus lived to the hour, and he said, you know, when you study that, the hour out, all the gospel writers record Jesus using that term, and John starts way back in chapter 4 to talk about Jesus using the term, he did it with the woman at the well, actually, uh, he used the term, my hour, the hour is coming, and, and so... What's really valuable about that is he was always talking about the concept that the Father had a purpose for him and that that purpose could be lived out every day 
in his life. Jesus lived his life from start to finish with the purpose of fulfilling what the Father had laid down for him to do. In John 17 and verse 4, he says this. He said, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Remember earlier in the Gospels, he said, I do always those things that please him. So here he is saying, he is saying, I brought glory to you by completing the work you had for me to do. Life has to have meaning. We're too complicated a creature to be here by luck. We're too complicated a creature to have no purpose. And if we are told all the time that there is no purpose for us, it disillusions us to the point we don't want to live. And so life has purpose, not one purpose. It has a whole purpose every hour, every day. Isn't it Psalm 139 where he said, I put all your days in a book before you're ever born. Now think about that. Every day God has recorded prior to your living it. Every day God has meaning and purpose for your life. It's not ho-hum anymore. It's I want to walk in and fulfill this grand design that God has for me. One of the reasons why we have so many people that are hopeless, living with nervous breakdowns and trying to commit suicide, is because we are wonderful creatures made in the image of God for the purpose of fulfilling the purpose of God, and we've been robbed of the knowledge of that and told that we're just animals. Go about to fulfill your animal instinct. Paul writes this to the Ephesians who were living under a similar philosophy that we are. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he writes, It was only yesterday that you outsiders, that you outsiders to God's way had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works. He said, Well, just just yesterday. When I met you guys, you had no knowledge that God had a plan for your life. You had no knowledge that God had a purpose for you. You just lived from day to day just doing it over and over. Hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel. Hadn't a clue what God was doing in the world at large. He said, you just lived your life every day and you had no idea that every day God was fulfilling a grand purpose and a grand design here on earth. And I want to say this because somebody has to say it. If you have no beginning and you have no map and no directions and no destination, you have no journey. That's pretty complicated, isn't it? If you don't start somewhere and have a purpose for your start, if you don't have a map of where you're going and you have no concept of where you're going to end up, there is no journey. Life is meaningless. Our world has been robbed of the knowledge of in the beginning God by us lying to them and saying it just happened by chance. All real knowledge and all real wisdom begins with the purpose of God, the fear of God, putting the Creator first, and having the concept that my life has design to it. The world is not here by chance. The world is not here by luck. The world is here by design, and so are you. You were made uniquely and differently and specially from everything else in the creation of God. You are not here by luck. You're here by divine design. Listen to what Jesus says to the Father in verse 5 of chapter 17. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. <laughs> wow. 
He said, you know something? Way back when, you had a design for my life. You had a purpose for me. You had something for me to do. Jesus has this deep inner knowledge that the Father had planned his purpose before he made the world. Think about it. We also must have that same perspective on life. If you are who God says you are, creatures made in his image, with each day planned, we cannot possibly enjoy life in thinking that we're here by a fluke of luck with no design. Can't possibly happen. Listen to Paul talking to these same Ephesians that I talked to you earlier about who had no idea about how God thinks. Listen to him talking about to them in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. Long before he laid down the earth's foundations. Now imagine this. Think of this. What's it say? He had us in mind. Before God framed the world, he had you in mind. God was thinking about you. Isn't that fascinating? Before God put the world together, he was planning you and your life. He had settled on us as what? The focus of his love. God had settled in his mind before he created the world that he was going to love you. That's amazing, isn't it? Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son. God had a plan that you and I could enter into a, a design that he made before he made the world. Just like the father had a plan for his son, Jesus, God also has a plan for your life every day. Every day. This is what Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 to 30. He says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. <laughs> Isn't that great? So Jesus was a pattern for you and I to live. He decided long before he made the world that he was going to have Jesus as an example and he was going to create a design for your life just like he did for his. Amazing. The Son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. We see what God wants for us by looking at his life. But just because God has this amazing plan for you doesn't mean there may not be some suffering along the way. That isn't not part of his plan. Listen to Jesus talking to the Father about what is ahead for us in John 17, verses 13 to 17. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be what? Filled. Filled with joy, not bored by sitting in church. <laughs> Filled with joy. He said, I, I told them a lot of things. I kind of be interested in reading that book now. So you could be filled with joy. So if you're not filled with joy, maybe you need to go back and read it again, right? I have given them your word. I don't want to read that next one, do you? And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. You ever feel like a fish out of water? Just as I do not belong to the world, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm not asking you, he said, to take them out of the world. Let them live in the real world but to keep them safe from the evil one. He said, keep them here, keep them safe. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. One of the biggest problems with raising children 
is we sometimes tend to treat them like houseplants. The first frost will kill them. Okay, <laughs> lots of laughs, no amens. <laughs> they are never allowed to go without any desire being fulfilled, totally fulfilled, and they are made to think, as my mother would say, <laughs> that life should be passed to them on a silver spoon. <laughs> and, and so when real life starts to happen, it's panic time. This is planet Earth, in case you haven't noticed. It involves pain. It involves suffering. It involves work. It involves heartache. And ultimately, it involves death. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, Jesus said. Even though the world hates them, let them live in it. There will be lots of miracles in our lives, lots of special moments where you will really get to see the hand of God at work in your life. Listen to Paul describing his life. Listen to it. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 to 4. Love this. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in the body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that cannot be expressed in words, things no human can be allowed to tell. Oh, I love that, don't you? Well, let me read the next verse, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 4 to 6. People are watching us as we stay at our post alertly, unswervingly. In hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed, Mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, with pure heart, clear head, steady hand. <laughs> I like verse 1 better. <laughs> I really love the days that I'm caught up into the third heaven, and I'm kind of learning to live with the other days. <laughs> I want to glorify God every day, don't you? I want to glorify God every day, whether I'm in the third heaven or the third hell. <laughs> Whatever it comes. You know, you read that second line and beaten up, put in jail, no third heaven and any of that stuff. <laughs> That's pretty real stuff. Listen to Jesus talking to the Father about you. In John 17 and verse 10, he says, All who are mine belong to you. Isn't that great? And you have given them to me. Why? So they bring me glory. There's a purpose for life. There's a purpose for every day of life. Is that the purpose of God for you today, no matter where you find yourself, to bring glory to God? Can you take up the cross that's handed to you and carry it with joy, knowing no matter what is handed to you, that you can face it with the help of God and bring glory to God? You know what fascinates me about the cross? What fascinates me about the cross is there was a lot in it for me, but there was even something in it for Jesus. I read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, and it said, Even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience from the things He suffered. Now, that's a big thing, isn't it? Even though he was God's own son, there was something he learned by what he suffered, obedience. In this way, in this way, in this way, 
God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. What do I learn from that verse? I learn from that verse it is in the way I suffer, not the way I get caught up to the third heaven that qualifies me to be the high priest or to be the priest of God. We're all thinking. It is the way I suffer. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. The attitude that you go through hard times with is what qualifies you to walk with God. How many times have I said to God, but God, you would be a lot more glorified in healing me than helping me suffer. Have you ever said that? <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one that thinks that way. You know, just a rational thought, isn't it? God, if you just, you know, like right now, you could change everything and, and praise the Lord. It would be so much better. And I'd thank you in front of everybody and be all over. <laughs> Didn't happen that way. Paul talks about that. He's talked about having a, a thorn that he struggled with and God's told him his grace was sufficient for him, didn't he? Life on planet Earth is not about suffering or not suffering. It's about glorifying God. Life on planet Earth is not about your suffering or your being delivered from suffering. It's about glorifying God wherever you are and whatever's going on in your life at the time. What life with real meaning is about is fulfilling God's purpose in your life today. That's where you find reality in fulfilling God's purpose in your life today. Paul wrote this to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4 in verses 12 to 14. I'm just as happy with little as with much. With much as with little. I've found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, Wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Paul said, put me in jail, I'll be happy. Put me in the palace, I'll still be happy. And it really doesn't matter anymore because I've been walking with God and I've been learning something. He didn't, didn't say he started out knowing that. He said, I've learned to be content everywhere. Doesn't matter anymore. And doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter how it's going on. Doesn't matter how I feel at the time. Doesn't matter what I think should happen at the time. What matters is there is somebody in charge of my life every day. And every day, that one in charge of my life has a purpose for me. And I can fulfill that purpose no matter where I am or what's going on in my life at the time. Praise the Lord. You know, we live in a world that tells us it's all just by luck. <laughs> it isn't. It's all by design. There's a road for you to walk on. God laid it down before he put the world in place. Imagine it. Imagine it. God had a plan, saw fit, to make you like you are, unique, special, different from all other creatures he ever made, and he laid down a plan for you to walk in, learn to glorify him in that plan every day. Learn to live in that plan and walk in that plan. You don't have to accept everything and never pray about anything. No. Pray about everything. But just because it doesn't end up your way 
doesn't mean you have to have a pity party every day. Just learn to walk with God. And knowing this, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't matter what everybody says, and it doesn't matter what it looks like. What matters is someone's in charge, and it's not me. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's not me. In our steps toward the cross, somewhere along the way of life, there has to be a glorifying God, the one who is in charge, and the one who laid out the purpose for you before he made the world. And so you can get up in the morning and say, there's lots of things, God, I'd like to see changed, but I will leave that up to you, and I will walk in the path you have laid out for me because you have the final say over everything that happens in my life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that before you made the world, you knew me fascinatingly. You knew me. And before you made the world, before you made planet Earth, you laid out a plan that I could walk in. And then you gave me the strength and the power to fulfill that plan and walk in it. And you gave me the ability to walk in that plan and always look to you. Oh, God, I pray for people listening to my voice this morning that are totally disillusioned with life. It hasn't worked well for them, or so they think. And Lord, I, I, I thank you today that you're right there with them even now. And if they will but look to you, they can see how this whole thing can glorify God. Jesus, I pray today if there's somebody listening to my voice right now that doesn't know you and has no idea about the plan you have for them, that right now they will open their heart and say, Jesus, I want to fulfill your purpose. Thank you for making me fearfully and wonderfully and creating design for me. I give my life to you. Forgive me and let me walk in hope. In Jesus' name. Yesterday I was walking in the woods and I was listening to the birds, little chickadees. And as I was listening to them, that verse came to me that God sees the sparrow when it falls. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, God sees the sparrow when it falls. He doesn't see the sparrow and keep it from falling. Very interesting, isn't it? God bless you. see the sparrow and stop him from falling. How would he learn how to fly? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You
way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are here touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are.
way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He is our light in the darkness. We could search for that light all day, every day. We would know that we don't have any problems to face because he will take them all and he will take care of every one of them. Do not worry, do not fret. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord and let him do the work for you. And as Pastor John said, you might fall a little along the way. You might break a wing here and there. It's all a part. I believe all a part of God's plan. You learn a lesson from everything. Thank you, Jesus. told me life may not be easy and everything that I need you've already given me I remember how you told me I can trust you completely so I am I